Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Tennis Coach Diaries. Now, since my last episode where I spoke about meeting Roger Federer and having a good chat with my coaching buddy Ben about how he got his player into the top 100, there's not an awful lot of exciting things that have happened in my life as a coach. Um, It's been great. I've had a couple of great weeks on court with my players and really developing the coaching program, but nothing super exciting to talk about. And so what I've done is I put a message out on my Instagram broadcast channel, inviting you all to ask me some questions so this episode is going to be a bit more of a QA. and a at the end of the video I'll talk to you about what I've got planned in the next few weeks so let's check out your questions so first question was from Kenny C if you could what would you tell your beginner tennis self so I started playing when I was eight and I would say for my first few years of playing I really used to compare myself to others as starting at eight um, compared to some of the other players that I was training with. It was actually quite late. Lots of the players as a junior had been playing since the age of four and five years old. So I think my biggest tip to myself would be not to compare myself to other players and to focus on my own tennis and my own improvement. But I'd extend that even to players who are adults starting their tennis journey. A good quote that I like is that comparison is the thief of joy. And I think we should all live by that, not just on the tennis court, but in day to day life as well. Um, Next question. I want to be a tennis coach and I'm 15 years old. Can I be in this age? So I actually started coaching around that time. I was think I was 15 or 16 and I was just volunteering at my tennis club with the younger juniors. So by all means, um, if you are at a tennis club or a tennis venue, um, it'll be worth speaking to the coaches there or the head coach to see if you get involved in some voluntary stuff. I think 15 is a great age to start as you'll really develop your communication skills and your ability to organize young juniors. So um, yeah, get in touch with your coaching team. So the next question comes from Bailey and it's, what should I do if my tennis isn't improving? Um, To be honest, this really, really does depend on how much tennis you're playing, what sort of level you're playing at, um, whether you're having coaching, whether you're competing and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, everybody hits a plateau at some point in their tennis journey, multiple plateaus. There'll be periods where you feel like you're really progressing and other periods where you feel like you're plateauing. One thing that you can do is to take a mini break from tennis. Um, I think this can be really, really important for people, especially when they hit a plateau. I think sometimes for players who are are playing very frequently, um, you can burn out. So a break can be good. It could be that you just take a step back, maybe video yourself playing and look at the bigger picture of your game. I think sometimes we get hung up on the details. Um, When you sit back and have a look at your overall game, there'll be some real positives in there, but also there might be some obvious things that you haven't seen because you're focusing too much on the finer details. So take a step back and look at the wider picture. But yeah, taking a break can also be good. Next question is, what's your go-to warm-up before serve practice alone? I actually spoke about this in a recent video that I did where I was fixing four of my followers' serves. I like to use uh, a football sock stuffed with two tennis balls and to shadow your serve motion. I think that's a really good one for serve fluidity. I also like to throw. Anytime you can do some overarm throws from baseline to baseline, that's a really good way to warm up as well. Uh, And finally, resistance bands. Anything that you can do to warm up your internal and external rotation of your shoulder can be really, really good as well. So yeah, anything that involves a throw, anything that involves some fluidity um, can really, really help you. Okay, I've just read I've just read the second post from this person. <laughs> How do you make a shot look less awkward? Sorry for misspelling the earlier one. Okay, how can you make a shot less awkward? I guess you're talking about timing because quite often if we miss time a ball it feels quite awkward, maybe we shank it. Um The key is early preparation and the key to early preparation is reading the ball well. So just try to focus around your anticipation skills and your ability to read your opponent's oncoming ball. If you can heighten that awareness, your timing is going to be much, much better. I also find that shortening your swing can be another good way to assist with timing. Obviously, if you've got a big wind up to your shots, there's a lot more that can go wrong with regards to timing. So yeah, work on your reading skills, your anticipation, and maybe minimize the size of your backswing. Uh, Next question, how to improve the correct distance to hit the ball? Exactly the same as my last answer, to be honest with you, is all about your reading skills. And um, yeah, trying to hit as many balls as you can from as many different situations on the court. So 
challenge yourself against different game styles and that sort of thing because that's the quickest way to learn how to read that oncoming ball. Next question from Palmer Coaching, who's a fellow coach of mine. Um, if you could play any tournament in the world, which one would you play? Now, Andrew, I'm guessing you're meaning if I was a professional tennis player um, and it would be Wimbledon, for sure, without doubt. Just think that tournament is super, super special, not just because it's in the UK, but I think just the history behind it, um, everything about the tournament is super special to me, so it would be Wimbledon. Next question, I'm struggling to get constant rhythm on serve, what to do? Um, when you talk about rhythm, fluidity is important. So as I mentioned about the, the previous tip, using a football sock stuffed with tennis balls is really, really good. But really, when it comes to actually rhythm hitting the serve, you just need to get as many repetitions in as you can. I would say some people struggle with rhythm when they throw the ball too high. So if you can bring your ball toss down slightly, if you feel that it's too high, that can help you because it means that you're not pausing at the back of your swing. Here, some people tend to throw the ball super high and have to wait in this position and this can really hinder your rhythm and your timing. So ideally you want that ball toss to be slightly higher than the point that you can reach with your racket, not much higher than that. Tips to help relax the arms and to have a smoother two-handed backhand. One tip that I use, very simple, is to breathe out when you're hitting through the ball. Breathing out as you strike can be a really good way to just relax and loosen your muscles as you swing through the ball. I think some people, when they're thinking about technique, hold their breath, become very tight and stiff and rigid in their shots. So um, focus on breathing out. That can be a really good way to practice. Um, also, a little drill that I like to do is instead of holding a tennis racket, is to hold um, a towel. It needs to be a fairly big towel, a bath towel or a beach towel. And you kind of want to roll it into a bit of a tube sort of thing, hold it with two hands and try hitting the ball using a towel. Sounds funny, but it's a really good way for you to really swing through the ball with both arms as opposed to one arm leading more than the other. Um, give that one a go, it's quite fun as well, good challenge. Um, next question. What's the one most important change to fix weak volleying technique? Generally speaking, most players struggle with volleys because they become too swingy um, and don't have enough control and stability over the racket. And so one little drill that I like to do is practicing the volley holding the racket with two hands. Let me just put my mic down. In fact, I'll clip it here. So imagine hitting volleys, but you've got to hold both hands on the grip. Now, as you hit your forehand volley, you can feel straight away that this really limits your backswing and stops you from following through too far. And you can do the same on your backhand side, just limiting how much you're swinging. Another version of this is you can hold your hitting wrist with your offhand. Another great way to limit the amount of movements that you make with your hitting hand. Because ideally, when we hit volleys, we want to use our legs more than our arms. So limit the size of your swing, and a little drill to do that would be to hold two hands or to hold your wrist. Next question from Kezekez. Who is the best ATP player to copy for forehand and backhand? Um, I've made videos on this before. Ideally, you don't want to copy pro technique because every pro hits differently. There's no perfect technique, purely because everybody is built differently when it comes to physicality. But things to copy are movement, contact point, balance upon impact, recovery, and these sorts of things. But if you're pushing me for an ATP player to copy, obviously in the past, I would have said Roger. However, say somebody different, I would say Kasper Ruud's forehand. Technically, you can't go wrong there. Very, very simple, very, very effective. Um, I'm gonna say Novak's backhand. Next question, if you could combine three players to make one, who would it be and why? Oof. That's tough. Now, I'm going to go... Oh, only three players. Okay, let's think about this. I'm going to pick Alcaraz as my first one, and I'm going to go with his forehand because of the amount of variety he's got with it and disguise as well. Um, I'm going to go Sinner's backhand. I think that backhand down the line is such a lethal weapon. Zverev's got a decent backhand as well, but I just think uh, we could actually put in Sinner's ability to attack and defend. I think there's not many players that can do it as well as he can. 
uh, and then I need somebody with a bomb of a serve. So let's go for a bit of an outsider, Hubi Hercatch. So they'd be my three players, Hubi Serve and uh, Alcaraz and Sinner can take care of the rest. Next question, as a 3-0 player or below, what should I be focusing on? Movement and anticipation. I think one of the toughest things at that level is being able to adjust to the variety of balls coming towards you. It's all good playing with a coach or a ball machine when the ball's being fed into your slots, but the challenge is being able to deal with variety. So play with as many different players as you can to deal with that variety and really focus on your movement and positioning and spacing. Um, the technique will follow. If you're getting yourself a good distance from the ball, it's far easier to hit with the proper mechanics than it is when you're getting yourself jammed up. So I'd definitely start there. Okay, just so this video is not super long, I'm gonna choose the next few questions as we've got lots of good ones in here. Okay, from JK Tennis. Um, JK is a long-term supporter of the channel, so thanks for your question. How long do you see yourself coaching doing tennis social media? My passion is coaching. Social media is just a little bit of a side thing for me. I love making the videos, hopefully you can tell. But yeah, tennis coaching is my passion and that's what I see myself doing until I retire, which will probably be never, to be honest. Okay, next question, match nerves. I get this question a lot actually about how to deal with pre-match nerves. This question, SC Burn, match nerves damage my technique. How can I prepare and offset this? Now, important thing to understand is that nerves are normal. Um, everybody feels nerves. It's just how you deal with them and how you respond to them. And so if you understand how nerves affect you, you can counter that. So for me, when I get nervous, the first thing that happens is my footwork slows down and my swings shorten. And this is similar for most people as when we get tight, this is what happens. And so because I know that when I get nervous, my feet slow down, I remind myself to bounce. So anytime I get nervous and I feel those butterflies, I use that nervous energy to feel energy with my footwork. Um, equally, I know that my swings shorten. So I focus on my breathing from one of those previous points that I mentioned. When I breathe, it allows me to relax through the swing and extend through the stroke. And so for me, my two cues are bouncy feet and breathing. Now for you, it might be different. If you recognize that when you get nervous, you overhit, maybe your cue will be to hit with more topspin. Or if when you get nervous, your serve always goes into the net, then it's simply adding extra net clearance. But yeah, try to figure out how nerves affect you and just be aware of that. And if you can counter that, it's gonna help to relax you and get you more prepared to deal with them. But nerves are normal. And so final question from my broadcast channel, how do you stay mentally strong after losing a break in a big match? So it's not easy, um, you know, especially if the match has been with serve the whole way through and all of a sudden you get broken. But by knowing the stats, it can really help. You're most likely to get broken after you've broken your opponent. And so just by simply knowing this can just give you that extra edge, that extra confidence to play better in the next game. And understanding that the great thing about tennis is every game resets, you're back to zero. And so as best as you can, you've got to try to forget that previous game and just focus on the very next point. Make as many returns as you can to give yourself the best chance to break back. So that'll do for questions as I am conscious that I was blabbing on a lot there. But um, just quickly before I leave you, I'll give you a couple of updates on what's going on over the next few weeks. So yesterday got an exciting package. I'm actually gonna be reviewing a new ball machine that's coming out on the market. Um, it's actually an AI ball machine and I'll talk to you more about it when I've actually tested it out, but it looks pretty exciting. Um, the second thing is I'm off to New Orleans soon um, at the end of this month to speak at a conference with Davor from Tennis House. So super excited about that. Pretty nervous as I'm going to be talking amongst three Grand Slam champions. So uh, yeah, pretty tight. And finally, I've booked in my next Might Up match and I'm gonna be playing against my brother, Maka. So stay tuned for that one. So yeah, there you go. Massive thank you to everybody that sent in questions. If you enjoyed that, let me know in the comments below as I might do another Q&A. Or if you didn't like it that much, let me know as well and I'll steer these conversations in a slightly different way. But hope you enjoyed the video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care.